Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the April 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And in this video, we're going to do an audiobook and discussion of Karl Kautsky's Ultra Imperialism from 1914, as contrasted with an audiobook and discussion of Lenin's introduction to Bukharin's Imperialism and World Economy from 1915, which also concerns imperialism, but Lenin disagreed with Kautsky's theory. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So hopefully it's fairly clear what this video is about from that introduction, but let me break it down a little bit more before we get into the reading. So Karl Kautsky was a famous and well-respected Marxist until World War I, which, as you may know, broke out in 1914, the same year as this piece, Ultra Imperialism. So why did Kautsky fall into disrepute or become a controversial figure? Well, he was a prominent leader within the Second International. This was basically a congress of all the socialist parties that existed at that time, at least the ones that had membership in it. And they would have meetings where delegates from all the various parties would come together and try to come up with some kind of international socialist strategy for revolution and to, you know, debate and discuss various topics uh, pertaining to the, the movement, the needs and the strategy and information and all that kind of stuff. So prior to World War I, as it was looking more and more like there was going to be a big war between the various imperialist countries, the International decided that in the event of that, they would advise all of their members, the working class of the various member countries, not to fight for the bourgeoisie, uh, but to fight against the bourgeoisie. In other words, turn war between the different national bourgeoisies into war against the various national bourgeoisies, or in other words, socialist revolution. Use the capitalist war, in other words, as an entry point for worker revolution. So that's what they came up with ahead of time. Then when the war actually broke out, Kautsky and other opportunists defected from this line. They betrayed the working class and the other socialist leadership, and they told them to fight for the fatherland. So defense of the fatherland and you know, sticking alongside and fighting for the national bourgeoisie. That's what they said. So Lenin wound up writing many books and articles against Kautsky as a result of this. You can find several of them in the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide playlist that we have up on the channel. But this became a huge theme. The opportunism of the Second International basically led to its collapse. And then several years later, after the Bolshevik-led revolution in Russia, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks helped us set up the Third Communist International to take the place of the now disgraced Second International, which again, basically told working people to fight and kill each other, you know, if they were on different sides of a capitalist national boundary uh, for the, quote, fatherland. Just complete betrayal. So Kautsky had been well regarded previously, and Lenin writes that in his books, you know, at one time. Kautsky wasn't a renegade, etc., but this was the period where Kautsky was really starting to falter. So September 1914 is where ultra-imperialism comes in. This was originally published in a magazine, Die Neue Zeit, and there's an editorial note from Die Neue Zeit. It says, the article below was complete several weeks before the outbreak of the war. It was intended for our number which was to have greeted the planned Congress of the International. Like so much else, this Congress has been brought to nothing by the events of the last days. Yet, although purely theoretical in nature, the article has not lost its relevance to the practice which it sought to help explain. We published the article with the omission of passages which related to the International Congress and the addition of some considerations on the war. So, that's the editorial note. So we're going to read Kautsky's ultra-imperialism next, and credit to Enda O'Callaghan from the Marxists Internet Archive for putting this into HTML and Marxists Internet Archive at Marxists.org for hosting it. Tons of important work over there, thousands of free Marxist texts, go check them out. After we get done with Kautsky, we're going to turn to Lenin's criticism of it. Now Lenin criticized Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism in a number of places. This is just one. 
Uh, Lenin, of course, did a much longer work, a book, an important book. It's one of Lenin's more important and well-known books, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. We will be covering that on the channel, but later it's in the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide. It's number 26. Currently, we're up to number 20, so we will be covering it. But I wanted to kind of get this in, particularly as all the discussion of, quote, multipolarity has been going around as Russia, you know, under Duganist influence is asserting, uh, you know, this is the era of multipolarity and they want to have this big intercontinental war. And we're getting some pretty distorted takes um, as far as, you know, these are anti-imperialist capitalists. And anyway, it seems to me it's time to revisit some of these topics and get some clarity. But after reading Kautsky's piece and then Lenin's piece, which again, was published as the introduction to Bukharin's book, Imperialism and World Economy, the following year. Uh, then I'll return with some comments. So that's what we're doing. Now on to Kautsky. We have seen that the undisturbed advance of the process of production presupposes that the different branches of production all produce in the correct proportion. Yet it is also evident that within the capitalist mode of production, there is a constant drive toward the violation of this proportion, because within a specific zone, the capitalist mode of production tends to develop much more quickly in the industrial than in the agricultural sector. On the one hand, this is an important reason for the periodic crises which constantly grip the industrial sector and which thereby restore the correct proportion between the different branches of production. On the other hand, the growing ability of capitalist industry to expand constantly increases the pressure to extend the agricultural zone that provides industry not only with foodstuffs and raw materials, but also with customers. Since the importance of the agrarian zones to industry is a dual one, the disproportion between industry and agriculture may also be expressed in two ways. Firstly, the outlet for industrial products in the agrarian zones may not grow so fast as industrial production. This appears as overproduction. Secondly, agriculture may not provide the quantities of foodstuffs and raw materials needed for the rapid growth of industrial production. This takes the form of dearth, or lack. These two phenomena may seem mutually exclusive, but in fact they are closely interrelated insofar as they derive from the disproportion between industrial and agricultural production and not from other causes, such as fluctuations in gold output or changes in the power situation of producers vis-a-vis -vis consumers through cartels, commercial policies, or fiscal policies. One of the two phenomena, dearth or overproduction, may easily pass over into the other because they both derive from the disproportion in question. An increase in prices always foreshadows the beginning of a crisis, although this emerges as overproduction and brings with it a price collapse. On the other hand, the constant drive of the industrialized capitalist countries to extend the agricultural zones involved in trade relations with them takes the most varied forms. Given that this drive is one of the very conditions of the existence of capitalism, it is still far from proven that any one of these forms is an indispensable necessity for the capitalist mode of production. So comment there, that's the introduction to this article. I just want to note, Lenin basically contested pretty much Kautsky's entire description of imperialism, starting with this whole thing about industrial countries versus agricultural countries, or the industrial versus agricultural sector, that he really didn't see a lot of merit in this and came up with a very different theory of imperialism. So just keep that in mind as we proceed. Also, another major point of difference is that Kautsky, as we're going to see, ends up with the position that basically imperialists at some point can decide to peacefully coexist and cooperate with each other, which was another major point of contention for Lenin. Continuing, next section is From Free Trade to Imperialism. One particular form of this tendency is imperialism. Another form preceded it, free trade. Half a century ago, free trade was seen as the last word of capitalism, just as imperialism is today. Free trade came to dominate because of the superiority of England's capitalist industry. Great Britain's aim was that she should become the workshop of the world, and hence that the world should become an agrarian zone which would buy England's industrial products, 
and provide her with foodstuffs and raw materials in exchange. Free trade was the most important means whereby this agricultural zone could be expanded continuously in accordance with the needs of English industry, and all sides were supposed to profit therefrom. In fact, the landowners of the countries which exported their products to England were as inveterate free traders as England's industrialists. But this sweet dream of international harmony quickly came to an end. As a rule, industrial zones overmaster and dominate agrarian zones. This was true earlier of the city vis-a-vis -vis the countryside, and it is now true of the industrial state vis-a-vis -vis an agrarian state. A state which remains agrarian decays politically, and usually economically too, and loses its autonomy in both respects. Hence, efforts to maintain or win national independence or autonomy necessarily generate within the overall cycle of international capitalist circulation the struggle for an autonomous heavy industry, which must under present conditions be a capitalist one. The development of outlets for foreign industrial products in the agrarian state itself creates a series of preconditions for this. It destroys the internal pre-capitalist industry, thereby releasing a large quantity of labor power which is at the disposal of capital as wage labor. These workers emigrate to other states with growing industry if they can find no employment in their home country, but would prefer to remain at home if the construction of a capitalist industry allowed them to. Foreign capital itself flows into the agrarian country, first to open it by building railways, and then in order to develop its raw materials production, which includes not only agriculture, but also extractive industries, mining. The possibility of adding other capitalist enterprises to these grows. It then depends primarily on the political power of the state, whether an autonomous capitalist industry develops. At first, it was the areas of Western Europe and the Eastern USA, which developed from agrarian states into industrial states, in opposition to English industry. They imposed protective tariffs against English free trade, and instead of the world division of labor between the English industrial workshop and the agricultural production of all other zones, which was England's aim, they proposed that the great industrial states divide those zones of the world that still remained free, as long as the latter could not resist them. England reacted to this. This was the beginning of imperialism. Imperialism was particularly encouraged by the system of capital export to the agrarian zones, which emerged at the same time. The growth of industry in the capitalist states today is so fast that a sufficient expansion of the market can no longer be achieved by the methods that had been employed up to the 1870s. Till then, the primitive means of transport which existed in the agrarian zones sufficed, particularly the waterways which had hitherto been the only possible form of large-scale transport of foodstuffs and raw materials, for railways had been constructed almost exclusively in highly industrialized and heavily populated zones. Now, however, they became the way to open up thinly populated agrarian zones, making it possible to take their products to the market, but also to increase their population and production. But these zones did not possess the means to plan railways themselves. The capital necessary for this and the directing labor force were provided by the industrial nations. They advanced the capital, thereby raising their exports of railway materials and increasing the ability of the newly opened areas to buy the industrial products of the capitalist nations with foodstuffs and raw materials. Thus the material interchange between agriculture and industry greatly increased. But if a railway in the wilderness is to be a profitable business, if it is even to be possible, if it is to obtain the labor power necessary for its construction and the security necessary for its operational demands, there must be a state authority strong and ruthless enough to defend the interests of the foreign capitalists and even to yield blindly to their interests. Naturally, this is best supplied by the state power of these capitalists themselves. The same is true of bids for the possibility of mining richer ores or raising the production of commercial crops such as cotton by the construction of vast irrigation works, undertakings which are also made possible only by the export of capital from the capitalist countries. Hence, as the drive for increasing capital export from the industrial states to the agrarian zones of the world grows, so too does the tendency to subjugate these zones under their state power. There was another significant moment to this, the effects of capital exports on the agrarian zones 
to which they are directed may be very different. We have already pointed out how badly off the agrarian countries are in this respect, and how they must aspire to become industrial countries, in the interests of their own prosperity or even autonomy. In an agrarian state with the strength to protect its autonomy, the capital it imports will be used not only for the construction of railways, but also for the development of its own industries, as in the USA or Russia. In such circumstances, capital exports from the old capitalist states only further the latter's own industrial exports temporarily. Ultimately, they cripple them, simply by fostering strong economic competition in the agrarian zone. The desire to hinder this is another motive for the capitalist states to subject the agrarian zones, directly, as colonies, or indirectly, as spheres of influence, in order to prevent them from developing their own industry, and to force them to restrict themselves entirely to agricultural production. Next section, the colonial danger and the arms burden. These are the principal roots of imperialism, which has replaced free trade. Does it represent the last possible phenomenal form of capitalist world policy, or is another still possible? In other words, does imperialism offer the only remaining possible form in which to expand the exchange between industry and agriculture within capitalism? This is the basic question. There can be no doubt that the construction of railways, the exploitation of mines, the increased production of raw materials and foodstuffs in the agrarian countries has become a life necessity for capitalism. The capitalist class is as little likely to commit suicide as to renounce it. And the same is true of all the bourgeois parties. Rule over the agrarian zones and the reduction of their populations to slaves with no rights is too closely bound up with this tendency for any of the bourgeois parties to sincerely oppose these things. The subjugation of these zones will only come to an end when either their populations or the proletariat of the industrialized capitalist countries have grown strong enough to throw off the capitalist yoke. This side of imperialism can only be overcome by socialism. But imperialism has another side. The tendency towards the occupation and subjugation of the agrarian zones has produced sharp contradictions between the industrialized capitalist states with the result that the arms race, which was previously only a race for land armaments, has now also become a naval arms race, and that the long prophesied world war has now become a fact. Is this side of imperialism, too, a necessity for the continued existence of capitalism, one that can only be overcome with capitalism itself? There is no economic necessity for continuing the arms race after the world war, even from the standpoint of the capitalist class itself, with the exception of, at most, certain armaments interests. On the contrary, the capitalist economy is seriously threatened precisely by the contradictions between its states. Every far-sighted capitalist today must call on his fellows, capitalists of all countries, unite. For first of all, there is the growing opposition of the more developed of the agrarian zones, which threatens not just one or other of the imperialist states, but all of them together. This is true of the awakening of Eastern Asia and India, as well as of the pan-Islamic movement in the Near East and North Africa. This upsurge is accompanied by the growing opposition of the proletariat of the industrial countries against every new increase of their tax burden. Even before the war, it was clear that since the Balkan War, the arms race and the costs of colonial expansion had reached a level that threatened the rapid increases of capital accumulation and thereby capital export, i.e. the basis of imperialism itself. Industrial accumulation at home still advances continuously, thanks to technical progress. But capital no longer rushes into export. This is visible in the fact that even in peacetime, the European states had difficulties in covering their own loans. The rates of interest they were forced to grant rose. This is revealed, for example, by the average market prices of, and here there's a graphic, I'll try to remember to put it on the screen when I make the video, they compare the 3% German national loans and the 3% French annuities between 1905, it's 89 and 99 respectively, then in 1910, 85 and 97, in 1912, 80 and 92, and mid-1914, 77 and 83. After the war, this trend will not get better but worse if the arms race and its demands on the capital market continue to grow. 
Imperialism is thus digging its own grave. From a means to develop capitalism, it is becoming a hindrance to it. Nevertheless, capitalism need not yet be at the end of the line. From the purely economic standpoint, it can continue to develop so long as the growing industries of the capitalist countries can induce a corresponding expansion of agricultural production. This gets more and more difficult, of course, as the annual growth of world industry increases and still unopened agrarian zones become fewer and fewer. So long as this limit has not been reached, capitalism may be wrecked on the reef of the rising political opposition of the proletariat, but it need not come to an end in economic collapse. On the other hand, just such an economic bankruptcy would occur prematurely as a result of continuing the present policy of imperialism. This policy of imperialism, therefore, cannot be continued much longer. Of course, if the present policy of imperialism were indispensable to the maintenance of the capitalist mode of production, then the factors I have referred to might make no lasting impression on the ruling class and would not induce them to lend a different direction to their imperialist tendencies. But this change will be possible if imperialism, the striving of every great capitalist state to extend its own colonial empire in opposition to all the other empires of the same kind, represents only one among various modes of expansion of capitalism. So commenting, that's the end of that section, and Kautsky's about to do the final section in which he basically lays out his idea of ultra-imperialism, which, you know, could be like a third stage of capitalism he was suggesting, from free trade, you know, sort of ascendant capitalism, to imperialism, then to ultra-imperialism, or super-imperialism, as it, it has sometimes been uh, translated. So, to summarize, Kautsky's saying that imperialism is digging its own grave. It was, you know, the new mode after free trade of expanding capitalism beyond the national boundaries and into the undeveloped world, the what he's calling the agrarian zones. And uh, But eventually, they're going to run out of agrarian zones, and there's other limits. And when those limits are reached, this may be the end of capitalism as an economic collapse, because it just won't be able to keep growing in this way. And he's also saying that if it's, as he says, indispensable to the maintenance of the capitalist mode of production, then no matter what anybody says, him or, you know, capitalists could even point this out, but if this type of imperialism is what is needed for capitalism, then they're going to just keep doing it, even if it ends up in their own ruin. Because the logic of capitalism really precludes many types of planning. They have to go on what is fairly short-term profitable, and so capitalism is really constrained by that. However, Kautsky is here theorizing that imperialists, if another course of action is materially possible, economically possible, then all the imperialists could get together and basically learn to cooperate with each other. But then this would be a shift and kind of the third period, free trade to imperialism to the next section, which Kautsky calls the next phase, ultra-imperialism. What Marx said of capitalism can also be applied to imperialism. Monopoly creates competition, and competition, monopoly. The frantic competition of giant firms, giant banks, and multimillionaires obliged the great financial groups who were absorbing the small ones to think up the notion of the cartel. In the same way, the result of the world war between the great imperialist powers may be a federation of the strongest who renounce their arms race. Hence, from the purely economic standpoint, it is not impossible that capitalism may still live through another phase, the translation of cartelization into foreign policy, a phase of ultra-imperialism, which of course we must struggle against as energetically as we do against imperialism, but whose perils lie in another direction, not in that of the arms race and the threat to world peace. The above exposition was completed before Austria surprised us with her ultimatum to Serbia. Austria's conflict with Serbia did not arise purely from imperialist tendencies. In Eastern Europe, nationalism is still a revolutionary mode of force, and the present conflict between Austria and Serbia has nationalist as well as imperialist roots. Austria tried to implement an imperialist policy, 
by annexing Bosnia and threatening to include Albania in its sphere of influence. This aroused the nationalist opposition of Serbia, which feels threatened by Austria, and is now a danger to the existence of Austria on its own account. The World War did not come about because imperialism was a necessity for Austria, but because by its own structure it endangered itself with its own imperialism. Imperialism could only have powered an internally homogeneous state, which attaches to itself agrarian zones far beneath it culturally. But here, a nationally divided, half-Slavic state wished to pursue imperialism at the expense of a Slavic neighbor whose culture is of the same origins as the culture of the neighboring regions of its opponent. Of course, this policy could only have such unexpected and vast consequences because of the contradictions and discord which imperialism has created between the other great powers. All the consequences ripening in the womb of the present world war have not yet seen the light. Its outcome may still be that the imperialist tendencies in the arms race accelerate at first, in which case the subsequent peace will be no more than a short armistice. From the purely economic standpoint, however, there is nothing further to prevent this violent explosion finally replacing imperialism by a holy alliance of the imperialists. The longer the war lasts, the more it exhausts all the participants and makes them recoil from an early repetition of armed conflict. The nearer we come to this last solution, however unlikely it may seem at the moment. So that's the end of Kautsky's ultra-imperialism from 1914. Before we go into the short piece by Lenin, which in part criticizes this, I want to note two main things, and maybe I'll think of something else, but I can think of two right now. So first of all, Kautsky himself notes that this whole thing is a hypothetical. He's considering different possibilities. He's saying that it's possible that, you know, the uh, armistice may not last and it would just be, you know, a, a short piece. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. World War I was followed by an interlude, the interwar period, and then World War II followed just about two decades later. But they kind of did both. I mean, the League of Nations was created after World War I. This was sort of an attempt at a, quote, holy alliance of the imperialists. And then, of course, later, this was replaced by the United Nations. While non-imperialist countries are members of it, it has definitely been dominated by imperialist countries, for sure. Now, following World War II, at least, there has been a long period of peace between imperialist countries. The United States and Europe have not been fighting with each other militarily, and although the Cold War also went on for decades, which basically, after the destruction of the USSR, was replaced with um, sort of the Cold War, but with only one side. So the, quote, unipolar era of, uh, you know, the United States and Europe being able to do pretty much whatever they want unopposed. That era is kind of coming to an end as China's economy becomes stronger and stronger, which probably not a lot of people were expecting, and which certainly many imperialists are angry about and don't quite know what to do with. Now, we're not imperialists here at this channel, we're socialists, so we're interested in class struggle, the independent organization of the working class for deposing capitalists and abolishing capitalism, and that's not going to be achieved just by imperialists fighting with each other in and of itself. You have to actually do class struggle and do revolution. Now, people right now are disagreeing about uh, you know, what's shaping up now involving, for example, the conflict between Russia and NATO. Uh, Russia is a counter-revolutionary, debased, degraded disgrace. You know, the former powerhouse within the USSR, now fully capitalist, and yet some people are still looking at this as though it is socialist, and that is... I don't even know what to say about that. Um, people don't know their ass from their elbow if that's the way they're looking at it. I mean, Russia could take over the entire world tomorrow. Let's say they could wave a magic wand and do that. Would that be world revolution? Would that be socialism? Not even close. Okay, so this is not really class struggle. It is fighting between capitalists. Granted, NATO, the EU, USA, uh, much more control there 
over the global economy compared to Russia. But as far as modes of production, who is the ruling class? Yeah, we're talking about capitalism. Capitalists on one side, capitalists on the other. I mean, much more powerful capitalists on a global scale on one side, but capitalists nonetheless. And as socialists, that's primarily what we're looking at. So this kind of brings me to point two, the final point here, is that even Kautsky said, quote, hence from the purely economic standpoint, it is not impossible that capitalism may still live through another phase after imperialism, the translation of cartelization into foreign policy, a phase of ultra imperialism. Here's the emphasized point, which of course we must struggle against as energetically as we do against imperialism, but whose perils lie in another direction, not in that of the arms race and the threat to world peace. So in other words, basically saying that for socialists in this proposed era, hypothetically, of ultra-imperialism, the concern would not be that the imperialist countries keep fighting with each other and you know thereby threaten world peace and buildings are getting blown up and all that stuff. But rather, the uh, you know imperialists would unify, and then would be increasing their subjugation of other parts of the world, and of course you know internal police violence and things like that. That would be the concern. And he said that we would have to struggle against that too. So therefore, if we were going to adopt Kautskyite terms and basically say that the period leading up to World War One and World War II, and basically culminating in World War II, was the imperialist phase, where the imperialists were fighting with each other. And then the post-war period, where the imperialists were not really militarily attacking each other, but had sort of formed a lasting truce. Uh, I mean, eventually in the case of Europe, like even the EU and things like that, you know, NATO, military alliances like that, um, that this rise of, quote, multipolarity, which again is not a Marxist theory, but this uh, multipolarity, well, first of all, on the checklist of logic here, is it socialism? No, the capitalist class, there's not been a social revolution. Capitalist class is still the ruling class. Okay, so it is some phase of capitalism then. So if we had free trade, then imperialism, then after World War II, this sort of ultra-imperialist phase of peace between imperialists, then multipolarity would simply be a fourth phase, arguably just reverting back to imperialism, where you have a new bloc, the one containing newly capitalist Russia. Russia has been capitalist for about 30 years. I mean, you can say what you want about the USSR, but let's just... <laughs> You know, 30 years ago was when they formally declared they were capitalist, at least. You know, whatever you want to say about the liberalization and reforms in the 80s and stuff like that. Okay, so formally, officially, Russia is capitalist, has been for 30 years now, and has built itself back up as a capitalist power in need of things that capitalist countries need. And they are butting heads with NATO in a very pointed way. And you have people like nationalist fascist theorist Alexander Dugin proposing that this is all the prelude to a great war between continents and this and that. Note, not a class war, not a war for socialist revolution, nothing remotely Marxist about it, but arguably a return to the days of imperialism. No more peace between the dominant capitalists exploiting other countries but now new capitalist powers, younger capitalist powers, coming on the scene to give them a run for their money. Now, sometimes people will try to portray Russia as some kind of, you know, social democratic national liberation movement, that they're targeted by imperialism, and, you know, it's a kind of national defense movement, nothing to do with imperialism or the further development of Russian capital. Is this true? I would say no. But here, let's pivot to Lenin's criticism of Kautsky's ultra-imperialism. And I kind of have a sneaking suspicion that, from a socialist perspective, we're still going to wind up agreeing with both Kautsky and Lenin much more than we agree with the Duganists. All right, 
So this introduction to Bukharin's Imperialism and World Economy from 1915 was written by Lenin, and it goes like this. The importance and timeliness of the topic treated in the work of N.I. Bukharin require no particular elucidation. The problem of imperialism is not only a most essential one, but we may say that it is the most essential problem in the realm of economic science which examines the changing forms of capitalism in recent times. Everyone interested not only in economics but in any sphere of present-day social life must acquaint themselves with the facts relating to this problem, as presented by the author in such detail on the basis of the latest available data. Needless to say that there can be no concrete historical analysis of the present war, again World War I, if that analysis does not have for its basis a full understanding of the nature of imperialism, both from its economic and political aspects. Without this, it is impossible to approach an understanding of the economic and diplomatic situation of the last decades, and without such an understanding, it is ridiculous even to speak of forming a correct view on the war. From the point of view of Marxism, which most clearly expresses the requirements of modern science in general, one can only smile at the, quote, scientific value of a method which consists in culling from diplomatic documents or from daily political events only such isolated facts as would be pleasant and convenient for the ruling classes of one country, and parading this as a historic analysis of the war. Such is the case, for instance, with Plekhanov, who parted ways with Marxism altogether, when, instead of analyzing the fundamental characteristics and tendencies of imperialism as a system of the economic relations of modern, highly developed, mature, and overripe capitalism, he started angling after bits of facts to please the Purishkeviches and the Milyakovs. Comment, these were Russian bourgeoisie. Under such conditions, the scientific concept of imperialism is reduced to the level of a cuss word addressed to the immediate competitors, rivals, and opponents of the two above-mentioned Russian imperialists, whose class basis is entirely identical with that of their foreign rivals and opponents. In these times of forsaken words, renounced principles, overthrown world conceptions, abandoned resolutions, and solemn promises, one must not be surprised at that. The scientific significance of N.I. Bukharin's work consists particularly in this, that he examines the fundamental facts of world economy relating to imperialism as a whole, as a definite stage in the growth of most highly developed capitalism. There had been an epoch of a comparatively, quote, peaceful capitalism, when it had overcome feudalism in the advanced countries of Europe, and was in a position to develop comparatively, tranquilly, and harmoniously, quote, peacefully, spreading over tremendous areas of still unoccupied lands, and of countries not yet finally drawn into the capitalist vortex. Of course, even in that epoch, marked approximately by the years 1871 and 1914, quote, peaceful capitalism created conditions of life that were very far from being really peaceful, both in the military and in a general class sense. For nine-tenths of the population of the advanced countries, for hundreds of millions of peoples in the colonies and in the backward countries, this epoch was not one of peace, but of oppression, tortures, horrors that seemed the more terrifying since they appeared to be without end. This epoch has gone forever. It has been followed by a new epoch, comparatively more impetuous, full of abrupt changes, catastrophes, conflicts. An epoch that no longer appears to the toiling masses as horror without end, but is an end full of horrors. It is highly important to have in mind that this change was caused by nothing but the direct development, growth, continuation of the deep-seated and fundamental tendencies of capitalism and production of commodities in general. The growth of commodity exchange, the growth of large-scale production, are fundamental tendencies, observable for centuries throughout the whole world. At a certain stage in the development of exchange, at a certain stage in the growth of large-scale production, namely at that stage that was reached approximately at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. Commodity exchange had created such an internationalization of economic relations and such an internationalization of capital, accompanied by such a vast increase in large-scale production, that free competition began to be replaced by monopoly. 
The prevailing types were no longer enterprises freely competing inside the country and through intercourse between countries, but monopoly alliances of entrepreneurs, trusts. The typical ruler of the world became finance capital, a power that is peculiarly mobile and flexible, peculiarly intertwined at home and internationally, peculiarly devoid of individuality, and divorced from the immediate processes of production, peculiarly easy to concentrate, a power that has already made peculiarly large strides on the road of concentration, so that literally several hundred billionaires and millionaires hold in their hands the fate of the whole world. Reasoning theoretically and in the abstract, one may arrive at the conclusion reached by Kautsky, who, like many others, has parted ways with Marxism, but in a different manner, that the time is not far off when those magnates of capital will unite into one world trust, which would replace the rivalries and the struggle of nationally limited finance capital by an internationally united finance capital. Such a conclusion, however, is just as abstract, simplified, and incorrect as an analogous conclusion arrived at by our struvists and economists of the 1890s. The latter, proceeding from the progressive nature of capitalism, from its inevitability, from its final victory in Russia, at times became apologetic, worshipping capital, making peace agreements with it, praising it instead of fighting it, at times became non-political, i.e. rejected politics or the importance of politics, denied the probability of general political convulsions, etc., this being the favorite error of the economists, at times even preached strike, pure and simple. General strike, to them, was the apotheosis of the strike movement. It was elevated to position where other forms of the movement are forgotten or ignored. It was a salto mortale from capitalism to its destruction by strikes alone. There are indications that the undisputed progressiveness of capitalism, compared with the semi-Philistine, quote, paradise of free competition, and the inevitability of imperialism, with its final victory over, quote, peaceful capital in the advanced countries of the world, may at present lead to political and non-political errors and misadventures, no less numerous or varied. Particularly as regards Kautsky, his open break with Marxism has led him not to reject or forget politics, nor to skim over the numerous and varied political conflicts, convulsions, and transformations that particularly characterize the imperialist epoch, nor to become an apologist of imperialism, but to dream about a, quote, peaceful capitalism. Quote, peaceful capitalism has been replaced by unpeaceful, militant, catastrophic imperialism. This Kautsky is compelled to admit, for he admitted it as early as 1909 in a special work in which he drew sound conclusions as a Marxist for the last time. There's a footnote there. That special work was his pamphlet, Der Weg zur Macht, or The Road to Power. Lenin mentions this in several works in which he criticizes Kautsky as kind of the last time that Kautsky really made sense. Continuing, if it is thus impossible simply, directly, and bluntly to dream of going from imperialism back to, quote, peaceful early capitalism, is it not possible to give those essentially petty bourgeois dreams the appearance of innocent contemplations regarding, quote, peaceful ultra-imperialism? If the name of ultra-imperialism is given to an international unification of national, or more correctly, state-bound imperialisms, which, quote, would be able to eliminate the most unpleasant, the most disturbing and distasteful conflicts, such as wars, political convulsions, etc., which the petty bourgeois are so afraid of, then why not turn away from the present epoch of imperialism that has already arrived, the epoch that stares one in the face, that is full of all sorts of conflicts and catastrophes. Why not turn to innocent dreams of a comparatively peaceful, comparatively conflictless, comparatively non-catastrophic, ultra-imperialism? And why not wave aside the, quote, exacting tasks that have been posed by the epoch of imperialism now ruling in Europe? Why not turn, instead of dreaming that this epoch will perhaps soon be over, that perhaps it will be followed by a comparatively, quote, peaceful epoch of ultra-imperialism, which demands no such, quote, sharp tactics. Kautsky says directly that at any rate, quote, such a new ultra-imperialist phase of capitalism is thinkable, whether, however, it can be realized. To answer this question, we have not yet sufficient data, unquote. In this tendency to evade the imperialism that is here 
and to pass in dreams to an epoch of, quote, ultra-imperialism, of which we do not even know whether it is realizable. There is not a grain of Marxism. In this reasoning, Marxism is admitted for that, quote, new phase of capitalism, the realizability of which its inventor himself fails to vouch for, whereas for the present, the existing phase of capitalism, he offers us not Marxism, but a petty bourgeois and deeply reactionary tendency to soften contradictions. There was a time when Kautsky promised to be a Marxist in the coming restless and catastrophic epoch, which he was compelled to foresee and definitely recognize when writing his work in 1909 about the coming war. Now, when it has become absolutely clear that that epoch has arrived, Kautsky again only promises to be a Marxist in the coming epoch of ultra-imperialism, of which he does not know whether it will arrive. In other words, we have any number of his promises to be a Marxist sometime in another epoch, not under present conditions, not at this moment. For tomorrow, we have Marxism on credit, Marxism as a promise, Marxism deferred. For today, we have a petty bourgeois opportunist theory, and not only a theory of softening contradictions. It is something like the internationalism for export prevailing in our days among ardent, ever so ardent, internationalists and Marxists who sympathize with every expression of internationalism in the enemy's camp, anywhere but not at home, not among their allies, who sympathize with democracy as it remains a promise of their allies, who sympathize the self-determination of nations, but not of those that are dependent upon the nation honored by the membership of the sympathizer. In a word, this is one of the thousand and one varieties of hypocrisy prevailing in our times. Can one, however, deny that in the abstract, a new phase of capitalism to follow imperialism, namely a phase of ultra-imperialism, is, quote, thinkable? No. In the abstract, one can think of such a phase. In practice, however, he who denies the sharp tasks of today in the name of dreams about soft tasks of the future becomes an opportunist. Theoretically, it means to fail to base oneself on the developments now going on in real life, to detach oneself from them in the name of dreams. There is no doubt that the development is going in the direction of a single world trust that will swallow up all enterprises and all states without exception. But the development in this direction is proceeding under such stress, with such a tempo, with such contradictions, conflicts, and convulsions, not only economical, but also political, national, etc., etc., that before a single world trust will be reached, before the respective national finance capitals will have formed a world union of ultra-imperialism, imperialism will inevitably explode. Capitalism will turn into its opposite. Written December 1915. That's the end of Lenin's introduction to imperialism and world economy the rest of which is by Bukharin. And we may do this text later when we do Lenin's Imperialism, The Highest Age of Capitalism. But I thought that, you know, these are sort of equal lengths, Kautsky's piece and Lenin's piece, so I thought that they would be nice side by side. So there's something that I'd like to highlight here. So, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, Lenin levels a lot of criticisms at Kautsky. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Lenin, there was no shortage of ink spent uh, criticizing Kautsky. Lenin wrote many, many works, including more than one book, in which criticisms of Kautsky and his opportunism featured prominently. Not surprising then that here in 1915, uh, you know, several long paragraphs criticizing Kautsky are featured. Specifically, some of those criticisms being that Kautsky is basically dodging the question of, you know, how to wage socialist battles during the age of imperialism, when the imperialists are starting the Great War and, you know, there's all sorts of convulsions going on and Kautsky's just sort of like defense of the fatherland, you know, but, oh, once the imperialists sort everything out and then it's ultra imperialism, you know, then, then, then we'll do Marxism again and then we'll struggle against it. And again, I made the point that at least Kautsky paid lip service to the idea of struggling against, you know, this ultra-imperialism after the imperialists have sort of sorted out their differences and, uh, you know, established the world corporation or whatever uh, that, you know, w that they would have to struggle against that. He at least mentions that, which to me is, uh, 
you know, though, though it may be a token gesture, uh, it's still more than a lot of the, you know, multipolar theory advocates are doing today. You know, to them, it's like, Rush is it, man. <laughs> like, this is the, this is the model. Uh, sorry, that's not remotely socialist. So one of these phrases that Lenin writes really stands out to me. So can one, however, deny that in the abstract, a new phase of capitalism to follow imperialism, namely a phase of ultra-imperialism, is thinkable? No, that you, you can't deny that. In the abstract, it's possible. And Lenin continues, in the abstract, one can think of such a phase. In practice, however, and remember, you know, they were trying to look at the tasks before them as leaders of the socialist movement in 1915. They were like, what do we need to do now? And Kautsky was off, you know, having workers shrink back from probably what was going to be a revolutionary moment as the imperialist war broke out. And he was telling people, don't fight the bourgeoisie. And Lenin was obviously infinitely frustrated and disgusted with this. So Lenin continues, yeah, in the abstract, you can think that maybe after all these convulsions of imperialism are over, that maybe there will be a phase of capitalism not marked by that kind of conflict, etc. But, continuing the quote, in practice, however, he who denies the sharp tasks of today, in other words, the war is starting now, in the name of dreams about soft tasks of the future, becomes an opportunist. That, to me, is what I see a lot of going on in the, quote, left today, is, uh, oh, it's going to be multipolar. Things are going to be so much easier then. Wow. Except here's the thing about that. War ravages countries. Most people alive today in an advanced country don't have a concept of the kind of ruin and destruction. Look at the kind of shape Ukraine is in after one month. That is not something you casually shrug off. It is life-destroying. Millions of people are displaced, etc. These are not easy conditions to organize in. All right? So, to me, I was tweeting about this earlier, and I wrote, quote, multipolarity equals competing versions of social democracy, neoliberalism, and fascism, posturing against each other on the global stage. It's a historical and anti-Marxist to think that this in itself leads to anything but reactionary war between capitalists. Class struggle is needed. So somebody replied to this, I think a well-meaning person, who said, uh, but wait a minute, you know, doesn't this war breaking out mean that the contradictions being sharpened? Isn't it, you know, an opportunity that we could take advantage of? And I said, you know, as for that opportunity... It's been here all along. The problem is that workers have rejected many opportunities to seize that opportunity under more peaceful conditions. And they said, yes, that is disappointing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, contrarianism going on that, you know, obviously isn't informed by any kind of Marxist thought. And I replied to that saying, more than just disappointing, it's an indication of a movement fully infiltrated by people who don't know their ass from their elbow when it comes to class struggle, and who want to sit back and let fetishized, quote, anti-imperialist capitalist states fight on workers' imagined behalf. So in other words, to me, and everything I'm reading and hearing and seeing, is disproportionately tons of emphasis being put on, oh, multipolarity is going to make everything so much easier. Again, these soft tasks of tomorrow dreaming about and what's being done now and what was being done last year and what was being done the year before that was the kind of organizing and connecting with people was that being done or was it kind of more armchair bullshit and even to the extent that it was an armchair like people weren't deliberately neglecting organizing but just you know the organizing wasn't coming along and now people are trying to console themselves because organizing efforts weren't fruitful enough, the masses weren't rallied, you know, etc. People are not poised on the brink of a revolutionary moment, and we're just waiting now for imperialist war to break out to seize that opportunity. Believe me, we're not in that position currently. But, yeah, again, you know, to the extent that this was not 
armchair arrogance and not a neglect of organizing, but just simply uh, unsuccessful organizing. You know, I think that's being charitable, uh, but let's let's just go with that for a minute. I think that there is an undue amount of wishful thinking, fantasy consolation going on with like, oh, it's going to get so much easier. Yeah, you don't know that. And honestly, I think that there is actually reason to believe the direct opposite. In other words, that five years from now, people will be looking back at when it would have been so much easier to do the organizing. You know, you listen to somebody like Dugan, who talks about Ukraine needs to be restored to Russia, and then like the Russian Empire can really be rebuilt. This is like a key piece, and on and on. Where's the end game in that? You know, there's a lot of talk about this being about defense and this and that. I, I don't think that. And again, for people who want to portray this as like pro-NATO, forget that. We've covered that, okay? Obviously, that is the world standard of imperialism. They have more blood on their hands than anybody else. The concern here is now you have some capitalists in Russia deciding to give NATO a run for their money. Is this good for the working class? I see a lot of, I think, delusional theorizing about, yeah, this will be good. They're pulling out of the monetary system. They're starting their own thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but is this just going to result in more conflict, though? Because kind of seems that way. Like, lots more conflict. And, again, the working class is not in charge of any of these countries. They're capitalist in nature. Some of them, at best, are kind of more progressive social democracies. But, you know, China arguably is at least nominally Marxist at this point. Many people dispute that, though. Probably about, it's 50-50 in terms of people, you know, whether they believe China is socialist or working towards it, and about 50% of people roughly believe that, no, there's nothing socialist about it, and they've basically abandoned socialism, and now there's some kind of, you know, social democracy, basically. That they've restored so much capitalism that that's become really significant, and they really can't be characterized as socialism anymore. I mean, whichever side of that divide you're on, the point is China's the only one that has any even stated commitment to Marxism here that's a major player in any of this. And they have not been real supportive of this war. They have refused to come down on Russia, who is a partner of theirs in many ways. I mean, they share geopolitical interests, like they occupy a similar chunk of the earth. They have been cooperating because... Neither country is particularly favored by the imperialist bloc for different, I would say, reasons. So, you know, they've refused to take formal condemnation in many ways that might be construed as giving NATO the green light to go do horrible things against the Russian people. On the other hand, whether China is truly supportive of like, yes, best case scenario, go Russia. I think that that really remains to be seen. I mean, just even on one point, as far as, you know, China's commitment, let's say, to international development of the overexploited world, well, what's happening as far as Russia and Ukraine, they're major wheat growing economies. So with this war, there's a prediction that like there's going to be maybe a third of the global wheat supply this year, something like that, might get wiped out. This is going to cause food shortages all over the world. Of course, richer countries are going to be able to get more of it, and poorer countries are just going to do without. And what's going to happen? Famine. So there's one impact to this. I mean, Joe Biden just the other day was talking about uh, there's going to be, quote, real food shortages, even in the U.S. So this is not good. Again, I ask you, where is the end game here? Who is actually benefiting in terms of the global working class? And people, again, want to talk about this. Oh, it's, you know, the 3D chess of the monetary system and this and that. I ask, was any of this necessary from a socialist working class point of view? Or does it actually generally have more negative impact on the global proletariat? 
So anyway, I'll leave you with these thoughts for now. Uh, we've now read a little bit more of, you know, Kautsky's ultra imperialism, Lenin's criticisms of it. To me, there are definitely some parallels to what's going on today. At least it can perhaps inform sort of examinations of these questions with current events going on. Uh, we're only, what, like six weeks into this whole Russia-Ukraine situation. It's maybe the opening salvo to something much bigger. That's what I fear and suspect. Um, I think it's going to send shockwaves in not a good way. I think that the people most excited about this are not particularly friends of the global proletariat, however they like to dress themselves up. I could be wrong, but uh, that's, that's definitely my hunch. And again, this isn't about being pro-NATO. Uh, yes, obviously, like we need to shift power away from imperialism, but we do that through revolution. And I think that the hard fact that not a lot of people really want to face is that that is just not on the agenda. One way or another, people either don't have revolutionary ideology anymore, or they have become so cynical and passive about the whole thing that they've basically written it off as a possibility, even if they theoretically believe in it and embrace that ideology. It has become limp and dead in terms of, well, that's never going to happen, so maybe this is the best that we can do. Except what I'm saying is, you know, smelling salts snap out of it like you're... Th like. You've fallen into a coma, your brain has turned off. This is despondency, this is despair. And I think people are sleepwalking towards possibly some major, major disasters and just kind of a nightmare. You know, and if you want to do that, obviously I can't stop people, but for fuck's sake, stop doing it in the name of socialism. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. Uh, what do you think? Leave a question or a comment below. We'll pick it up there. Otherwise... Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for as little as $2 a month or more. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so I really appreciate them. They've enabled me to spend more time on this channel than I would have been able to do otherwise. So the more the merrier and the more videos you're likely to see. Otherwise, of the videos that do get made, engagement helps. So thanks to everybody who is doing the liking sharing, subscribing, commenting, even if it's just thanks or good video. I see you, those who are doing that. I really appreciate it. All of that helps new audience members to stumble across this content. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of questions about what's going on in the world. Your engagement with the channel makes it that much more likely for somebody else to come across this content than, I don't know, Ben Shapiro. So much appreciated and the future audience members. Thank you as well. Anyway, we'll leave it there, and thanks again. We will catch you in the next video.